the bee can both bite and suck, and to do this it uses two different sets of tools. To bite it uses the mandibles, and to suck it uses the proboscis. The proboscis is very important to be able to suck nectar, a sugary solution, from the nectaries deep within flowers. Some flowers are quite deep, so the longer the proboscis the better, but then this long structure needs to be folded away. In order to fold the proboscis away, a complicated set of movements takes place in the bee involving around 11 main components. And I'm going to aim to outline the main movements in this process during this video. The names of these different components are in general use amongst insects, so although they're not the easiest names to remember, or even necessarily the most logical, we're stuck with them and we have to live with what we have. Let's start off with an overview. The place where the proboscis is folded away is known as the fossa. It's a recess behind the chin, effectively, below the neck, at the back of the head. The various components are folded away here when not in use, and then when they are needed, they are swung forward, and a series of components rearrange themselves to form into a tube, and we'll say more about that shortly. This tube allows the powerful suction muscles of the pharynx within the head to suck up from the nectaries of the flower, with the tongue passing down the centre of the tube, able to also help to bring up nectar to be sucked. And in order for this suction to take place, once the proboscis is swung into position, there has to be an airtight seal around the mouth. The proboscis is also stabilised in its forward position by the mandibles. Another role of the mandibles is to hold the proboscis steady. So that's a quick overview of what happens when the proboscis is brought into use. Let's look at the various components. And we're going to begin by looking at the components at the back of the proboscis, the components at the base. In this image, the head can be thought of as lying flat on a surface with the mandibles to the left and the neck just off the image to the right. We can actually see seven structures here, although only the main ones are visible clearly. This group of structures all move when the bee wants to use the proboscis, and in this image they move towards the left. If we look at these same structures from the side in a proboscis which has been dissected out, we note the straight structure going upwards, known as a cardo, and there's one of these on each side. This has a key role in the moving forward of the base of the proboscis, because its top end is held rigidly in a socket, and from this pivot point, the whole of the proboscis swings forward. Let's take a moment to name the other structures of the base of the proboscis. The large central structure is the prementum. Either side of this, are two dark shaped structures, the stipes, and behind these a triangular, stu a triangular structure, the postmentum. If we look at the structures again in position in the fossa, we also see a narrow structure winding round the postmentum known as the lorum, which effectively holds all the components together at the back of the fossa. In this image, the entire base of the proboscis has been swung forward, pivoting on the cardines, which is the plural of cardo, and now the only part of the base of the proboscis that we can see is the triangular point of the postmentum, and the fossa seems empty, so that we can see the flexible membrane which lines the fossa around the proboscis. Looking at these posterior proboscis structures in a dissection, here we see the two cardines and the lorem, and between them, the postmentum. This histological section shows the top end of one cardo, which is the brown circular structure, close to where it pivots. The cuticle lining of the wall of the fossa can be seen to the left. This image shows a diagrammatic representation of a head of a bee seen from the side and cut through the centre. The components of the proboscis are shown in brown, and the cardo can be seen to be arising from deep within the head, and this is the point that pivots and moves the rest of the proboscis forward. In the first image, 
the muscular tube of the pharynx, that is the, the mouth, can be seen to be open to the outside and the proboscis is fold away back on itself. The bee then starts to move the proboscis forward using muscles to swivel the proboscis around the, around the cardo and at the same time to unfold the proboscis extend it downwards. As we get to the third image on the right, the proboscis is in its fully forward position. In this position it forms an airtight seal against the mouth, allowing the suction of the pharynx to act right down the proboscis, sucking nectar from within a flower. Let's look at the components that form the tube that the bee is able to suck up through. The front of the tube is made of two structures shaped like rabbit's ears, each known as a gallia. As the proboscis extends, these two structures form the front of the tube and they overlap each other, the curved side of one over overlapping the curved part of the other. The back of the tube is formed from the labial palps. These thinner structures join together in the midline at the back and form a semicircle which fits into the back of the much larger semicircle of the two gallii. Here's the proboscis in its forward position seen from the side. The two labial palps are hidden within the curve of the gallii. In cross-section we can see the two larger gallii overlapping each other with the semicircle of the two labial palps fitting into the back of the curve of the gallii. These four components fit together so well that an airtight seal is created so that liquid can be sucked up this tube. The purple structure in the centre here is a section through the tongue. We'll say more on the tongue at another time, but here's an image of the tongue. It's flexible and covered in huge numbers of hairs. So we've now met all of the structures of the proboscis, and here they are in diagram form spread out. We can now see how the two gallii each attach to a stipes on each side and the labial palps and the glossa or tongue both arise from the prementum. This complex and flexible structure allows the bee to keep a foldable drinking straw tucked away behind its chin which can be brought into use when needed. That ends this video explaining how the bee can both bite and suck. Further details about bee anatomy are available in this book, Understanding Bee Anatomy, and more on this on this website.